Good morning. <laughs> See, it's picking up. Um, we're going to begin by, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Nancy and Dan, if we may be informal here, to each say a few things briefly <laughs> about their own experiences and you know, their, their reason for wanting to be here and agreeing to be here with us. Nancy. Thank you. Well, I'm really delighted to be here, and I feel a bit like I'm preaching to the choir, but I'll, I'll preach away here. Um, so I think what's most important from my perspective, and I've worked on this for you know, many decades now, is really that the, what it takes to really find, cultivate, and lead to success, the talent pool of America, is way more than any one kind of institution can do. And so everything I want to argue, and it's, it's really what you've all at Pace and what, what Teagle has been promoting, is that we need a kind of cross-sector, cross-institution, pathways to opportunity program that everybody sort of gets in their institutional DNA. It's going to be different for every institution, but that everybody gets there. So in, in two minutes flat, what are we at Rutgers University, Newark? We are a highly diverse, no um, majority racial or ethnic group, majority Pell eligible, huge number of first generation, a lot of dreamers, a lot of reentry students, uh, just the entire um, gamut, if you will, of, of the talent that's out there. We're a public institution. We are deeply committed as an anchor institution in, in the city of Newark and in greater Newark. And what we want to do in the Newark City of Learning Collaborative, which is a 60 cross-sector and 60 kind organization that we are the backbone for, is to increase the post-secondary attainment rate of residents of Newark um, from 18% to 25% by 2025. Um, that may not sound like a lot, but it's a huge lift um, in terms of thinking of how you coordinate resources and talent. But most importantly, what it requires is that higher ed change its way. So we need to be deeply engaged in K-12, and we are. So every other Saturday, for example, 150 10th graders from the Newark Public Schools are in a huge university community arts collaboratory doing STEM to STEAM, and not only with our faculty, but with our community-based partners, narrating the experience of the newest Americans, thinking about what 3D printing might have to do with where they want to go in life. So the idea here is that first, you got to deeply engage with K-12 and bring to bear community-based organizations. Newark, since it's 50 years since the Newark Rebellion, and there are amazing community development corporations and community-based organizations that know the talent out there, and we have to bring that to bear. We then work very closely in the Newark Public Schools to supplement the resources that are available. So Desiree, I think, mentioned, or mentioned um, guidance counselors. We do huge amount of professional development for guidance counselors because they can't possibly do the kind of facts of work that you need to do. They can't deal with the fact that the IRS system is down now and what do they do? We have to help. So all those sort of levers that you all out there are working on have to be brought together. And the thing that we call it is a farm team approach. So think about Major League Baseball. It creates farm teams and communities, and it changes the community by creating a farm team. That's really what we all need to be doing. And then finally, as an institution, a higher ed institution, um, and I know Dan is doing a lot of this because we work very closely together, we have to change our ways. We have to think about merit in totally different ways. We have to search for talent in different ways. And we have to create. For example, we have an honors living learning community that is revolutionizing, just to be biased here, <laughs> the notion of honors. Because when, when our students read New Jim Crow, they can tell us from their own experience what's right in it and what's wrong in it. 
So they are teaching us as much as we are teaching them. And they work as cohorts together, and they engage back in the very communities from which they came, including mass incarceration communities, including dreamers, including everything you can imagine. That's where the talent pool is, and we have to have a commitment to that. So I'll stop so Dan, Dan can tell you great things. <laughs> uh, well, I guess one reason why I'm, I'm here is because uh, anything Judith Shapiro asked me to do, I'm going to do. And then when she said I could be sitting next to Nancy, that would be you know, incredible. Um, but uh, I guess I, I believe in what we're talking about from you know, first-hand experience. And um, I'll, I'll just say three things. One, um, I'm the child of a, of a single mom who went to college in her 30s at a local public alternative uh, for her in Baltimore. And she was really turned on by the liberal arts. It would have made a lot of sense for her to pursue a certain kind of education and maybe, and I mean this very respectfully, but maybe to have become like a legal secretary, which would have been something she would have been great at. My grandmother was that. Um, but she went back to college in the 30s as a single mom, and, or went to college, and ended up loving history. And so taught while studying history at Towson, it was at Towson College in Baltimore, kept studying history, kept teaching in the daytime, kept going to summer school, kept going to night school, uh, kept getting degrees, and ended up um, becoming in her 40s, when she got a PhD, a signature thinker in the history of women in the American West. She's written a number of books about prostitutes and prisoners and um, uh, women who took care of families uh, in the West in, in you know, time of national um, uh, transition. And you know the perspective that she brought to the field of history um, could only have come from her her perspective, her lived experience. Um, you know, it, it wasn't people weren't writing history about prostitutes in the American West in the 1980s. <laughs> that wasn't history. In fact, that was what they said. It wasn't history, and she <laughs> had trouble getting a job for a while, um, but ended up really creating her field. And so, you know, liberal arts education, I, I believe, is for everyone. Um, doesn't mean that everyone has to go to liberal arts college. Doesn't mean everyone has to study it when they're 18. Doesn't, doesn't mean there's one pathway. But I think that saying that someone that liberal arts college is for X and not for Y, I think, is a huge mistake because it's it's ultimately about our humanity. And I've taught in prison, and um, you know the, the men I taught in prisons were were taking a course a year. It's a long trek, um, but. Didn't they have? Didn't they deserve the opportunity to have the lens of literature and culture to interpret their position where they were? Um, so a that, b I think I, I just love the idea of this because I've seen a lot of um, college or university local partnerships um, really work. And one of the things about colleges and universities is that they're they're very old, so they they change slow sometimes, especially maybe private ones. But if they but when you embed something into the DNA of a college or university, it then is there forever. Um, and so if you build something right, if you build it well, it stays. It may, it will evolve, but it stays. And I was involved in a couple programs when I was a student at Georgetown University in the 80s uh, where we created programs students did um, to work with court-supervised youth and then to work with recently arrived undocumented families from El Salvador in DC. And you know, 35 years later, those programs are much better than the ones we created, but they're still there. They're embedded. Um, it's the beauty of endowments. If you want something to last, you make an endowment gift, and then that, that thing is safe and can develop itself well. Um, so that's something. You know, it's really worth it to engage colleges in partnership with communities around challenges and opportunities ideally defined by the communities for partnership with the college um, and to bring the resources of higher education to all form of community enhancements, whatever they might be. All, all, no one way, right? Every, there's, there's, there's so many ways. Third thing I'll just say and then stop is that, it, so Franklin and Marshall College is a um, liberal arts college, 2,300 students. It's, it is a, um, it's like some of the schools that are, he, I think, here today. I, I think Skidmore, Smith College maybe here, that um, uh, Vassar maybe here. It a, it's a, has a national recruiting footprint, but is embedded in a local community, in our case, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is the refugee capital of America. The New York Times and BBC have both written about how uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania is 
um, setting a, an example, the, so the opposite of this example, uh, the, this example. And um, it's fantastic. It's amazing. You wouldn't think that necessarily if you don't know Lancaster. It's also been called in the New York Post, by the way, the New Brooklyn. So, uh, so, 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 New Brooklyn. Think, yeah, yeah, no, so, so, That's not yeah, good news. Yeah, I, I like it. I'll, I'll take it. I, 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 I want it. So, but here's my, and so here's my big point, though. So, I won't go through the things we're doing in Lancaster now, but there's you know, many, many good things, but, but we're a national institution, and so we need to embed ourselves in communities of meaning beyond our immediate proximity. We, ha we, we have to. We, so we're embedded in relationships here in New York City, uh, in Newark, um, in, uh, in Miami, a big one, uh, in, in California, in Los Angeles. We have big relationships. We're partnering with access organizations, startup high schools, um, scholarship programs. Uh, in a wide range of ways. I don't want to summarize all the ways, except to say that um, we, we are all in relationship with communities and people that we don't see, by definition. That's what it means to be a citizen mm -hmm. in the, on the planet. We're, in, we're, in, we're embedded in relationships, and so we should be both cultivating the ones where the communities we see, absolutely, but also with that, be looking to cultivate meaningful relationships with communities that we will see because we reach out. And, um, and the two together are not in conflict. Well, I will only say as an aside, which we can't get into here because it's beyond our, our uh, mission, if it does become the new brick Brooklyn, all those people you want to serve are going to have to move out because they can't afford to live there anymore. Yeah. That we will not <laughs> yeah. get into here. Yeah. Well, now. If, if, if we get, get Jay-Z and Beyonce in the deal, maybe it's okay. I don't know. We'll <laughs> <laughs> so you both talked about, on the one hand, the importance of of a team effort that involves colleges, community-based organizations, and other significant others. Um, and also talked a little bit, started to talk a little bit about what is the college's contribution to the mix and what both benefits and maybe challenges you've had to overcome. And I'm wondering if we could, you know, sort of dig deeper into both what your institutions have contributed, what they may have found difficult, and what, how they've benefited because we've already, in a sense, started to talk about yeah. that. So yeah. let me start and, and quickly transition to yeah. Dan. Um, I think there are a number of things that, that stretch the, the typical patterns of colleges and universities to do the work we're all talking about today. So not the least is what I mentioned earlier, but I think is terribly important, is that we have an incredible incredibly narrow sense of what's a talented student and of how, where to find them and of how to cultivate their talent. Um, the economist Raz Chetty, who I adore, has an, a wonderful notion of birth lottery and that really, I would argue, what we're all about is changing the birth lottery. Um, some kids are born on third base and other kids ha aren't even near first base, right? And it's not about talent, it's about the birth lottery. And he has lots of data to show the intergenerational transmission of lack of mobility, if you will. So what we're all about is uncovering that. But that's not gonna be done with narrow assessments like, and pardon those who love SATs, we do SAT prep in all the newer public schools, but Really, we need to have a sense of how to get to talent. That brings us then to the second thing colleges and universities have to do, which is create really seamless, engaged partnerships in communities. I, I take Dan's point that some you can see and some you can't, but when you can be deeply engaged in communities with networks and in the public school districts, when you can create that farm team, then you start seeing talent in a very different way than if you're doing it at a distance. So I think it is a real conundrum for national universities, and we all recruit all over. I'm a public university, so we are very committed to our locale, but we also recruit all over. So it is a challenge. On the other hand, we really have to take on that challenge. And then I think what happens so importantly is that we have to figure out how to transform what we think faculty are about. 
What's a faculty workload? What's a discipline? We're not going to change the talent pool and the cultivation of talent and the success of amazingly smart and able students out there unless we think about, for example, collaborating with community colleges. So you've got to do a path. The vast majority of first generation students are going to have their first taste of higher ed at a community college. We have, as institutions, have to pair our faculty with community college faculty and think about curriculum, pathways that make sense for success. We have to invest resources. Rutgers Newark has, a, a, as of this year, we have a new financial aid system such that any resident of Newark with an adjusted family income of 60000 or below or any community college transfer with an adjusted family income of 60000 or below goes, has a full scholarship, a last in scholarship to Rutgers Newark. Without that, we're not going to break open the opportunity. But that means that our faculty, our administrator, our one-stop services for students have to really take into account the perspectives of those outside of the institution. And that's not something we're all terribly good at doing. Yeah, well, which, well, she is. She, uh, you should be Secretary of Education, but I mean. Now, now that, that's a concept. Uh, at the moment, anybody should be Secretary of Education. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you you no, led me to that one. <laughs> um, so, you know, so, so the, uh, all of us can, all of us that are part of an institution have the ability to make change. And um, that's one of the great things about institutions in American life is they have a lot of prominence and value and respect. And so you can um, you know, adjust them and have them respond to uh, un unmet or unseen or emerging or ignored needs. And, but you have to have the will and the skill to do that. It's not just like a matter of like showing up and saying out of some act of authority, well, I now decree we shall do the following. Um, you know, it's, it's change making takes, um, takes takes collaboration within institution as well as without. And um, so what, what the, the big thing that we've done at Franklin and Marshall in the past five or six years, and, and again, I'm not standing on a different island than Skidmore and Smith and Vassar, who have done great work in this exact space, is we have moved the demographic of the student body pretty dramatically in about five years from being a school where roughly 5% uh, of the incoming student population were el eligible for federal Pell Grants to one now where 20% are eligible for federal Pell Grants. And so as in moving, you know, it's probably, a, probably end up being a tripling when you looked at some averages. And uh, in making that move, it's actually, um, it, the key to it was talent, was, un was defining uh, a talent with the faculty and with the alums and the board and having the, those groups see and, and come to believe that there is incredible talent across the country in all communities um, and, uh, and often taking um, the form of groups that were so dramatically underrepresented at the school that they were effectively invisible. Um, and so you know, the, the, we, we, in making this move, we've become a much stronger school, academically much, much stronger by virtually every metric. Um, our applications, three years running, 30% above the all-time high. Our um, Pell Grant students have the higher retention rate. Last year had a higher four-year graduation rate than student body as a whole. And we're drawing kids from all the elite schools of New York City, all the elite private schools, um, you know, along with a, a number of great public and charter schools and Catholic schools in New York. Um, our, the grades of the Pell Grant students, same as student body as a whole, same B average. We, we've winning, kids are winning all kinds of fellowships. And we had, we had nine Fulbright winners this year, the most we'd ever had before was four, almost all first-gen college goers. Um, the faculty are, are now fostering among themselves uh, a lot of work on inclusive pedagogy. There may be colleagues from the Mellon Foundation here. Mellon has invested in our ability to recruit faculty who, whose life histories predict they will be great at working at multicultural classrooms. Like the, the, the work is just, it's organic. Get people bought in, get them to see the, the the logic of embracing talent and change can happen. Uh, I don't think top-down works. It might work in a, in, in a military organization or something or, or 
you know, the things that Irving Goffman studied, you know, uh, prisons, but they, you, can't, you can't do top <laughs> down. Yeah, yeah, right, you can't do <laughs> top down. Yeah, I mean, not, <laughs> but you cannot do top down work effectively in a college se setting, partly because the, the governance model is very distributed, very, very distributed. Um, but again, the great thing is that if you engage people and they take on the work themselves, then um, it has a long, it, it embeds and it's sustainable. Uh, I don't think there's any chance that Franklin Marshall is going to go back to being a school with five or six percent Pell Grant students. So the, the, there's too much success and pride and joy in what we're doing. Uh, now you, you mentioned challenges, so I just wanted to just say I won't uh, you know, follow up if we want. There's of course challenges in bringing kids together from different walks of life in a segregated society where they haven't interacted before, absolutely. And there's especially a challenge with, um, I would say, with kids from more privileged communities, disproportionately white, who don't particularly choose to engage. Um, and uh, again, again, I, I sort of say to the first-gen kids in the school and the, the, um, all the different kinds of newcomers in the school, that they're the center of the school. If people aren't engaging, that you can't will them to engage, but just they're not doing the actual work of Franklin and Marshall College. The work is done by those engaging at the center. And when you change the demographic of a student body, then of course that, that changed demographic calls for the institution to do more work in the community. They want to use their passion for learning to benefit people immediately, not wait until they're you know, 30 years out of college or something. Um, so that's been fun to see, our kids driving some new ideas on how we can make a difference in and beyond Lancaster. And then just the last thing is that there's so many extraordinary uh, access programs and scholarship programs. I, I think colleagues from SEO are here today. It's, there's so many great programs across this country. Uh, you know, so many. Um, we work with as many as we can, like at least 10 or 15 different partner groups, and we've learned a ton from Posse, from College Match, from College Tracks, from Step, yes. Stepping Stone, from Say Yes. Yes, we work with them. We, we've, learned a, uh, we've learned a ton. And, um, and so by being in relationship with access providers, we've become one. We now are running college counseling in 20 rural schools in Pennsylvania um, ourselves. Uh, and we also are, um, have a bunch of our students getting paid through a program called Matriculate to work as college advisors right now. And so that's pretty cool. You know, we're, we're, we're expanding the notion of how we do the work of promoting right. learning because we've engaged in the, the talent strategy, as Nancy said, of drawing real talent to the school that we hadn't been drawing before. Now, Nancy made mention uh, of resources, and I guess just given you know, constrained, the constraint on resources for all institutions of higher, well, some more than others, um, how are you seeing uh, the sustainability going forward? Maybe just uh, address that relatively briefly, because another question I want to ask you before we go to the Q&A, is to focus in on what two or three things yeah. would you like people to take away in terms of something to really so, focus so on? So I'll, I'll go first if you want this, and say something just, just, just blunt. Um, so in order to put more, a lot more money into financial aid, we had to, to end a practice that's very common in higher education, actually two practices. One, one of which is called merit aid, or non-need-based aid, which is when schools discount the price um, more than what a family would need or often give scholarships to students that don't have aid eligibility as a revenue strategy to get more payers into the school. And the problem with that approach is that you end up not offering aid to highly talented, exceptionally talented, lower income students. Um, so we completely abolished uh, merit aid and that took some work. Um, there also was a practice at Franklin and Marshall and other places, it's called gapping which is when a student does not receive an aid package that meets their full demonstrated need. Um, I have no problem with a modest loan. I think that's fine. It's appropriate. Um, from, you know, um, but it shouldn't be they're borrowing $80,000 because the school's not meeting, providing the, the fundamental grant that meets full need. So we phased that out. Um, and getting rid of those two approaches was essential, absolutely essential. We no way you go from 5% Pell to 20% Pell using merit aid. And there's no way, it's, it's not, you could do it, but it wouldn't be ethical to not meet full need. Um, so I guess I'd say the financing of it, therefore, is really um, a matter of, of setting priorities and saying our priority. Like, you could try to do this at a private school secretly, like let's just sort of add to our aid group, let's just, let's just become more ethnically inclusive. You could try that. 
And I think a few schools have actually tried the like yeah. stealth. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it, and then they'll wake up and they'll be in, in the promised land and say, wow, we got there. But I think it's actually much better to be very transparent. And Especially direct. if you want to sustain it. Yeah, way. exactly. Right. Much better. So, we, so we were, we've made it the center, the central plank of our strategic plan. And you know, the faculty voted for the plan. The board voted for the plan. We could have not voted for it. Once they voted for it, let's run with it and, and succeed. And it becomes central to fundraising. Exactly. Now, the, I, will, I don't want to make it up. There's not like just money falling out of the trees, to be <laughs> honest. But it just, it's, not, it's hard. And the, the, right now, you know, we're in the work, as a, my other colleagues from higher ed are here, of, of yielding our class. We'll know the final sort of starting point, I guess I'll say, the final, the final before the starting point of the wait list on May 1. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite um, more like a white knuckle time than it's ever been in higher education if you're working on the, this side. If you're giving out merit aid, it's not as hard. But if you're giving out, if you're meeting full need and attracting a huge number of, of, of low-income students and also need to, absolutely need to draw at least, you know, 60% of the population has to be paying a significant amount. They can receive some aid and at least 30% have to be paying the full thing. The, the economics of that are, are, A, challenging. You have to have a stomach to ride it out. Keep the board at bay because the board the board wants to be assured that they're not going to be presiding over a bubble. Um, so that's that is that's quite challenging. Um, and then secondly, um, you know the school has to offer a value proposition to 100% of the students. If it if it offers if I, if I get a little too cocky about our talent strategy, and people think well if I'm a student of means I guess they're not really going to focus on developing me there, then I won't have a school. Um, we really have to function you know, across a set of uh, economic and social communities at my school that very few institutions actually have to focus on all the communities the way we have to. And if we fail, there's a huge price to pay in like real term in dollars the next year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So far it's been going fine. But, it, but, but it, you know, that said, uh, if you want to find me in the month of April, just go into our tech center at night because I'm doing webinars to accepted students all around the country and around the world, making sure these kids can talk directly to me about what we offer, because I, because that's what it that is what it takes. <laughs> Nancy, so, so I would say absolutely ditto to what, although as a public institution, yeah. you know it's it's very different in some respects. But I think um, in addition when you do the broad mapping of the American demographic as who you really are committed to creating opportunity for, you then have to structure your institutional supports, both financial and otherwise, in very nuanced ways. So for example, we have to think about now, what are we going to do with our dreamers? What are we going to do when we create, we're putting up a building for our honors living learning community, residential honors living learning community, and that's gonna be an entirely different experience for most of the students that are, that are gonna live there. So when we build that building, we have to think about what it means. One of the students in next year's cohort of HLC was just released from prison, 30 years in prison, went to prison when he was 18. He's going to be living in a building with first year, more typical entry students. We have Muslim students who need particular kinds of prayer spaces. We have LG LGBTQ students who need to feel a sense of safety in that. So we sit, you know, when you think about challenges, what I'm trying to say here is that we have to be as nuanced in both how we teach the pedagogy, the physical shared spaces, and the most important thing we find for that is that our community-based organizations, some of them locally and many of them nationally, have way more insights to bring to bear about where the pressure points will be. And so the collaborations, for example, that you support in this, from my perspective, what's critical about them is really that you do a, a kind of shared networking 
to pool knowledge about what are going to be the pressure points, both in terms of access, but also in terms of success, so that we don't just do business as usual. And when you think about that, I mean, you know, I like to tell pe people look at me and they say, how can you, Rutgers Newark, be supporting the Run to the Top financial aid program that I, that I just talked about? And I said, well, you know how I can? Because if I don't, Raz Baraka, my friend, the mayor of Newark, will be in my office tomorrow saying, what are you talking about? What do you mean you're not doing this anymore? Well, I say that very concertedly because one of the things for our community-based organization, both local government, corporate organizations, CBOs, one of the things that you can do is create public pressure and support for higher ed leaders and for faculty and for professional staff who want to transform institutions this way. Because otherwise, it's all on the Dan Porterfields in the world to convince the boards or the whatever that, yeah, come heck or hell or high water. You can say hell. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I did two things today. My Family would tell me not to do. Don't we, talk about Betsy DeVos. Everybody is sick of me talking. <laughs> but, but, but my point there is that we tend in higher ed to think that it's a conversation about institutional transformation and about investments and commitments that is totally within the institutional structure maybe with a board, but it's within the institutional structure. America needs a public conversation. We need the outside in to put the pressures on us to really commit to the things that will make a difference in the future. Yeah, if I could build on that, that's, that's um, so well said. And you know, so each of you um, have a platform from which you are doing your work. And um, you're doing that work and you're making those impacts right there with the circle of students or community groups, families, neighborhoods you're working with. That, that impact has happened. And um, what we've done at my institution, of course, is to try to have our impact. Um, but we're also putting resources into trying to um, really disseminate. I don't just mean research papers, as good as that is. Really disseminate and talk about the fundamental core mission and learning that comes from expanding opportunity. Um, what we're learning from our partners, what we're learning from our students, why it's not as hard as some schools might right. think. Right. Um, being like, so you, everybody has a platform. And if, you're, if your work is working, I think it's worth it to try to use your platform right. as well as do your work. Exactly. That's what Nancy said. Like, exactly. like, use your platform. Exactly. And, and you know, she's a role model for how to use your platform. <laughs> Um, you, and, and by using your platform, you have the power of, the, of your immediate stakeholders then see that the mission of the work is about the dissemination of ideas and values that can change some of the circumstances that the work is addressing. Exactly. And so they become invested as leaders thinking like, hey, our group does work, it matters. And hey, we're making an impact, our trajectory is going up, we're, we're influencing others. And that then, I think, motivates communities to invest even more and to get even more sort of like joy out of the work you're doing. I think this is a very good pivot to the Q&A because the point that's emerging is to make sure we benefit as much as we can from the very fact of our partnerships in terms of what we need to learn from one another and in terms of how we can put our efforts together to achieve the kinds of changes we need to see. So with that, I think is someone wandering around with a um, Ah, yes. Uh, so time for some questions from... Thank you very much. I, I learned a lot from everything that was said. You might want to say uh, wh whom you, who I am. where you're from okay. and whom you represent. Um, my name is Charlotte Marchant, and I work at Long Island University in downtown Brooklyn in the School of Education. Um, the one thing that I, I was having problem with was the use of the word talent. I kept having visions of um, some of those television shows, you know, I forget what they're called, American Idol, and et cetera. America's Got Talent. Um, 
So I'm wondering is if there's another way to, to use that term, because for me it just meant some people have it and some people don't. Some Ten people are born with it and some people aren't. Yeah. And um, I'm just wondering, is that a, I, I haven't heard it at my institution, is that an academia thing or where, where is that word coming from? So in my, in my context, um, I went and um, interviewed the whole school when I started. 80 different focus groups with everybody, alums, feeder schools, every department, every single one, met with them all, every administrative department, um, in order to understand the values of the school. And I had an understanding that we were going to be able to really increase our inclusiveness. And as I listened to the community, I was convinced that they wanted to work with kids who were hardworking, positive, resilient, um, interested in ideas, uh, believers in education. And they wanted that. They really wanted that. And it happens to be a test optional school too, which is great. Um, that's talent. That's what talent is. And we have based the whole of our effort on talent on the idea that the school should not turn talent away. In, in a school like mine, if your agenda, and I, I'm, <coughs> I'm just gonna be really candid. In a school, and I was at Georgetown before, same thing there. If, you're, if your school has an agenda, if your agenda is social justice, it will be dislodged in a higher education institution. There'll be, there'll be times when it works, but eventually it will be dislodged. Who's justice? If your agenda is diversity, period, it will be dislodged. People will hear that as somehow counter to some other value. Uh, if, your, uh, if your standard is um, business functioning, good, good, good revenue, you'll be dislodged. What can never be dislodged at a higher education institution is giving talented people the opportunity to develop themselves. But was there some work involved? Because you, you don't share the same definition of, obviously, yeah. the word doesn't conjure up the same thing in your minds. So in order for it to be an effective concept, Everyone has to agree that that's what it is. Well, that won't happen, though. You're not going to get societal agreement. No, on, no, no. But you're, with, with Franklin and Marshall, there was a series of conversations whereby they say, ah, let's use the word talent for all of these things that, we've just, that you've just listed. Yeah. That's what we're really looking for. So that's what they hear, and that's what they know yeah. they're looking for, as opposed to somebody who can end up with a singing well at the age yeah. of eight. That's right. That's right. When, 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 uh, so, and, we are, and we are deeply, we, we, com we consider one's cultural background, ethnicity, family, part of talent. Exactly. The ability to use one's right. identity is talent. Right. That's, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, as a social psychologist, I can get into a question of whether it's, it's person or it's environment, but the notion behind both of what we do is really a person-environment interaction where what you're getting in terms of talent has to do with the insights, the experience, the perspectives, the values, the passions that individuals bring to bear when they're in a context that, like John Dewey, cultivates that talent. But I think it would be a mistake, honestly, for us to eschew the notion of using the jargon of talent what we want to do is put that on its head. We want to say talent is in all these corners that people assume it's not. And really try to think of it as a talent pool. I mean, after all, that's what higher education is doing. It's cultivating a talent pool, right? As a resource, an, an intellectual and human capital resource. And so the question is, how do we commit to a much broader talent pool. And what we do is that we do intense interview, group interview sessions for the Honors Living Learning Community, for example, looking at leadership and perseverance and grit and looking at, at creativity and problem solving and how you work in groups and things that have nothing to do with anything you could argue came in some DNA. But just to add, since we all come from our own disciplinary interests, there is indeed a sociolinguistic task be, to make sure that what you are sending out is corresponding to what is being received. Right. 
So we yeah. have to do make Absolutely. sure that, that you know the people. No, it's know. a very helpful yeah. thing. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for, um, for this Q&A, it's been really great. Um, my name is Ben Sweet, I'm the academic coach for the Bard Educational Opportunity Programs at Bard College. Um, so something that I've been really curious about, honestly the reason I came here, is that I see a lot of practices at Bard specifically that are kind of like, we have the Bard Prison Initiative, we have, we work with Posse, we do all these things. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but there's still this culture that is really slow to shift in terms of like, being a primarily white institution, what it really takes to support underrepresented students, sorry. Um, so my question is that as a staff member and as someone who's kind of lower on the totem pole, who's really interested in having these conversations about like, how do we shift a paradigm? How do we include Paula Freire's work? How do we include Paul Dewey's work? How do you begin those conversations when you have kind of a lack of power in terms of your position? So. <laughs> You have yeah. to make so Leon Botstein feel guilty. Yeah. 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 Good, lu good <laughs> luck. Good luck. Good <laughs> luck. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I actually think you are asking really, really a fundamental question of institutional change that many of us have thought a lot about. Um, and in fact, I think, Dan, you and I have had a conversation about yeah. this, about how do you cultivate what I call sort of grassroots change agents in institutions when they typically aren't going to have a lot of power, right? And what I always come back to again is the role of the outside in, the role of the collaborations that bring a broader resource group from the outside into the institution in collaboration with you um, so that the voice is actually a bit more hefty, if you will, because it's kind of a pressure point on change. Um, I think our biggest problem, and I am a deeply, very much a faculty member, but I think our biggest problem is that we think the change is gonna all come from the standard faculty disciplinary silo that, that creates pedagogy and that creates admissions or that creates standards or, you know, the, the 80 groups Dan met with and I did the same thing at Rutgers Newark. For me, the change comes from the intersection of, in this, I'll use the word broadly, CBOs, and the public coming in, connecting with professional staff and faculty, but also with students at the table. So what I see us doing is cultivating the next generation of students who are going to then come back and really change these institutions. Um, we have faculty members now who were first-gen students at Rutgers Newark, have gone on to get PhDs, are back teaching our students. And they are so connected to the professional staff who want to make opportunity. You can, you, I, I have observed in my career in higher education that virtually every single human being who works in a college or university at some point feels they're marginalized. Everybody. I mean, the, I mean like the, the provost. Like they, they think, oh, you know, I'm not in the middle of things. And I would just I would encourage you, because I, I really do take your point, I would encourage you to think of Bard and, and other colleges anywhere you work, not as a hierarchy but a network with nodes of work right. happening all over the network. And that your job as a change maker is to get to some of those pre-existing nodes and add. And then draw some social capital from those nodes when you create your own node. Um, and, and then to all that, the biggest thing that requires, hard to do, is to give yourself permission to adopt the values of the institution, claim them, and then act on them. Like, don't wait for it to be assigned. Just, just claim them. I, when I was at Georgetown, I had a, I, I, I forget how many people I had when I came in there working, super reporting to me, but I had much fewer when I left, but I had more influence. Because I was, I, w I developed this theory that it, Georgetown was a network and I was gonna either contribute to nodes or make new nodes and not, not trouble myself with waiting for an assignment. And that's not always easy, I realize. But, <laughs> as, a, as, a, but as, a, as a mentality though, as a mentality, bring, you know, put yourself to the nodes where the action's really important, what you care about. Get there and then go create some new node and draw the resources from the other nodes you've helped to your thing. 
And maybe you'll start to feel like, wow, I can change, I can change mm -hmm. things here. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm a little bit shorter than the microphone. <laughs> I, know you can, you can I know that feeling well. I can, uh, you you can pull bit. it out and hold it. Pull it out. Okay. No? There you go. Um, so my name is Danielle Moss, and I head the YWCA of the City of New York. Um, but I also sit on the Board of Managers of Swarthmore College and co-chair our Student Affairs Committee. Um, so I am really excited about the level of institutional commitment to kind of broadening how we define talent, um, how we identify talent. But as a manager, I also heard you say something about sustainability. Um, and uh, there's another liberal arts college in Pennsylvania that recently moved from a need blind uh, strategy to a need aware yeah. strategy. So I feel like just when the conversation is becoming more robust and beginning to get traction, um, there's this kind of threat to long term sustainability. Um, so is there a role for the, exter the extended community to play? and making sure that institutions that have traditionally not served these communi communities as effectively, that are now kind of really making a huge push, can continue to sustain that work. Uh, I mean, I we're doing a capital campaign, yeah. obviously, right. but I think there's a broader threat um, to the work. Right. I, I would just say, uh, in response, uh, particularly given that not all colleges have Swarthmore's resources, that one should take a more nuanced approach to what it means to be need aware. Um, it may we, just we're be. You're not need aware, but there was another. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Swarthmore can afford not to be need aware. Other, because it has endless amounts of gazillion dollars. Um, but <laughs> compared to many other institutions, if you are, if you give as much financial aid as you can afford to manage, and then at, one, at some point in your admission strategy have to become need aware, that is different from either giving merit scholarships or gapping, yeah. uh, right. which I think we would all agree are evil things to do, right. and it's better not to do them. But some institutions, given their resources, they do their best <laughs> to give out as much financial aid as they can afford, but then at some point they do. Yeah have to be need aware is, is the only answer I give to that. But you're quite right to point out the importance of giving as much need-based aid as an institution possibly can manage to stay in business if it deserves to stay in business. Yeah. Is that, does that sound fair? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with that question. And, um, <laughs> because I'm living in the same world you're in. In fact, we play Swarthmore you know, 20 sports a year. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, the, uh, this is going to go back to the word talent again, so thank you for that earlier question. Um, ab about a couple of years ago, as we were starting to get really terrific results with our uh, Pell eligible students in terms of grades, retention, scholarships, graduation, uh, we made the choice to try to, we couldn't get bigger as a school. We, you know, we had to build more dorms. So what kind of, could we have impact at scale that wasn't a bigger Franklin and Marshall College? And we only, we only have 100,000, this sounds like a lot, I know, 100,000 endowment per student. So we have a, not, not even like $250 25, million. It's a lot, but it's actually something like 300 or something. I am not feeling sorry I know, for I you. <laughs> so what, we wanted to get to schools that had the $500 million endowments and had the $750 million endowments. And so what we did was we created something called the American Talent Initiative, in part with, with uh, support of Michael Bloomberg. And Swarthmore is in it, uh, and Bart is in it. And it is a coalition of schools that have set a national goal of 50,000 more low-income students together attending um, 270 schools in the country. And that 270 number may get bigger, but they're schools that have, uh, can, can enroll many more low-income kids and, could gra and are showing high graduation rates. So um, uh, Peter Sloan's here. He, he was at one of the first meetings of this. Um, we started with, we announced 30 schools on, in December, and it included some big name schools. And you might say, well, you know, are they really gonna increase their Pell percentage? Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, Duke, Georgetown, WashU, uh, big public institutions, like, like lots of, uh, lots of uh, Williams, Amherst, you know, they're really gonna do it. And um, what we all committed, we would do it to get a national goal of 50,000 more low-income kids. We've now expanded it, there's now 65 schools in this. 
And um, uh, so this is one way, not the only way, it's one way that change happens by aligning institutions together towards a goal that's bigger than any of us. Finding partners together to say, let's compete not against each other, let's compete together to get 50,000 more low-income kids in our types of schools. Is it going to work? I, I think so, but we'll find out. You know, history has to be created. Um, but it's pretty exciting to think that the logic of collaboration can bring schools together in the service of low-income kids. Is the, is the foundation support need-based? Like, does Franklin and Marshall get more than Princeton? No. Uh, in fact, we're, we're, we may have to have like a fee-for-service model. If we help Princeton, <laughs> they pay more than... than um, what, what, what Mayor Bloomberg is supporting is the staff work done by the Aspen Institute and Ithaca s and to put this coalition together. And it was pretty cool that Valerie Smith, you know, like said, I, first thing out of her mouth, I am in this. I really want to be in this. She's amazing, by yeah. the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Adam Friedman. I'm the director of the Pratt Center for Community Development. You need to speak into the microphone. Yeah. Hi, yeah. I'm Adam Friedman. I'm the director of the Pratt Center for Community Development. And we grew out of the School of Architecture and Urban Planning 50 odd years ago, helping uh, community groups to rebuild. You know, Banana Kelly, bed Restoration, El Puente, providing architectural services. Now we work with all the departments, environmental systems management, economic development, a whole variety of services. And the question goes back to the, the earlier question about resources. None of us have staff lines. The question is, do you use tuition dollars to fund the community engagement projects that you have? Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's really a mission question. Yeah. I mean, is it part of your mission mm -hmm. to provide those services in community engagement? And do you see kind of a, a positive feedback loop there? So I, I'll jump in, yeah. and I know Dan has answers too. Um, I have a very strong yes to that answer. So all the work we're doing as an anchor institution, for example, in Newark, with community-based organizations is to create, for example, shared spaces where we pool resources. And a lot of it is our resources going in. So we have in downtown Newark um, 50,000 square feet in the newly renovated um, Haynes building that was empty for three decades. And it's a university community arts collaboratory. And local arts organizations are in there with our artists and, and media and journalists and, and um, public humanists, and we're, we're fronting that. That's our space, but it's really shared space. It's jointly run, local nonprofits, artists, groups in there, and they are funded through. And if we didn't do that, it would fall apart. It has to be something where you pull resources in there. And it has a huge positive reward cycle, as you know, and I know the work that Pratt does. I mean, it just has to be funded. Um, we have staff that we fund, we have faculty, we have technical resources in there, and it, there, it's for the community to use, and they do. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Like well, only just that most mm -hmm. foundations that can jumpstart projects do expect the, the institution to put skin in the game, too. So, um, and then if you want to create something, you have to invest your seed money almost always. People always say to me about our Pell strategy, uh, well, um, so how did you, uh, what did you cannibalize? That's, the, that's how they put it. I've asked that a hundred times. What did you cannibalize in order to give, to invest in talent, in, 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 in financial aid? And the truth is we didn't cannibalize anything, but we had to make some smart financial decisions. Um, we had to phase in a little bit slower, compensation increases. We had to reallocate our deferred maintenance budget and stretch some things over time. We had to go uh, refinance our debt and get a bit, luckily we could get a better interest rate, spread the payment out, and create some flexibility in the operating budget. Um, we had to um, fundraise more purposefully towards these things. Um, so, you know, the, the, I think the, I really like your question. And I also think that college leaders often use the excuse that they can't invest in valuable work because there's no money. but you, you really can manage budgets in many cases. I don't know if Rutgers Newark has any fat in its budget anymore. You know, probably not, right? But, but in schools like mine, but we, we found can a still way. do it. Yeah. And we do do it. Yeah. I mean, it's no excuse. Exactly. No excuse there to say, if you really believe in the things we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. 
I think we have time for one last question. Yes, here. Thank you. Melanie Brooks with Scholarship Plus. We're a New York City five borough based college support program providing last dollar need plus four years of support through college. And I'm just curious, aside from the wonderful and compelling discussion about what you're doing to support uh, this population in your environment, grow it, define it, expand it, what are your most pressing needs at this moment? Is it identification of the population, the broadening population you want to accept? Is it finding the financial aid, expanding the financial aid uh, dollars that you need? What, what is, at this moment, given all that you've done and the stretching and the cannibalizing or whatever, yeah. what, what are the, your most pressing needs right now? Thank you. So, do, do it. Yeah. so all of the above, and I mean yeah. that not at all glibly, um, uh, you've hit a number of the things that are really, really pressing. I think for us, one of the most important things is to pay as much attention to the infrastructure of university community collaboration as to the particular programs that we're running or the particular projects. Because this goes back to the sustainability question we talked about before. We don't want a one-shot thing where we're bringing in one cohort of 10th graders from newer public schools, but oh, next year we can't do it again. We, we want to create enough interdependence between City Hall, Rutgers Newark, all the CBOs, the arts and cultural organizations, the corporate community, such that if there's change in leadership, if there's a, a a heart, you know, if we get a budget cut from the state and we can't do a particular financial aid, that, that others feel the need and the interdependence and the responsibility to come in and, and work with it. Um, so it's got to be, um, I think the worst thing that we all do in our institutions, both in community-based organizations and in universities is, and colleges, is that we think that everything is on ourselves and that everything is about a project. It's like, oh, you got this grant, you're going to do that. You know, oh, well, what happens next, right? What happens when it's done, right? And we don't pay as much attention to the infrastructure of the collaboration. Um, it's almost like, from a social psychology perspective, it's like the best thing to get continued behavior is for people to make public commitments. Yeah. That is yeah. like yeah. for sure the way yeah. to get people to continue yeah. doing stuff, right? Um, yeah. And I think we, we just don't do that enough. Dan, you yeah, want to add something? Well, uh, that, I like that, le that line. That is the logic of the American Talent Initiative. Right. Get them, get them all on the record. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think, I th um, so I think that Secretary Desi D just gave a, the, the, the A plus answer. Um, <laughs> What I think that is so. We're so, just going to call yes, you that. Yes, I'm not family. done. I'm not. I'm not done. And We're, tell your yes, family. 20, 2020. <laughs> uh, the thing that I, I guess I think is this is a, maybe a, a bit of a big answer, but um, we just have have as a society we have to go make the case for education much more intensively. Um, you know, look at the since 2008, 45 states are fund, spending less than they were spending in 2008 on public education, um, public higher education. Um, I mean, that's, that's amazing. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the, the Tea Party dominated legislature has ripped to shreds the higher ed budget. So the people going to schools that have done very well in the Chetty research at elevating lots right. of people, at least one right. quartile, right. lots of them, um, that, that are getting, they're really getting stung with sh cost shifting to families. The average debt at these right. Pennsylvania public colleges now at graduation is about $38,000 for public school, mind you. Uh, Franklin and Marshall charges twice as much, or is twenty six thousand at graduation. Um, come on, and um, and then you know, and now you've got proposals in D.C. that are some of them are going to be supported probably to you know wipe out work study for God's sakes. You know, work study. How many college students go work in communities with work study? Right. Um, AmeriCorps. Who needs AmeriCorps? Well, everybody in this room needs AmeriCorps. Right. Um, so I, I actually think that this is the a, the big calling is how does a democracy build its talent, its citizenry, for a global knowledge economy without investing in education? Right. And how does a 
increasingly more pluralistic society bring people together from diverse walks of life and from, uh, to overcome the supposed differences that, that prevent community, except by education. And yet we treat education as a society, and I'm, I'm about to stop the rant, because I didn't do it too. We treat it, <laughs> we treat it like an expense about the same as ICE money at the Pentagon. Right. Um, and so that, that to me is the greatest challenge we, we face. It's the whole environment in which we try to do great work, um, almost, almost like we're, we're like alternative to the, to the actual needs of the nation. Amen. <laughs> Not what our founders had in mind. Uh, I don't think so, exactly. exactly. Uh, so Thank let you. me thank Dan yeah. and Nancy, yeah. and uh, that was a great speech today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>